Good morning, everyone, and welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And at this time, uh, if you have any kids, kindergarten age or under, we ask that you take them to the lobby, to the kids' check-in area. If you want to stay with your child throughout the service, you can watch it in a special family room. We stream the service uh, all throughout the building and online. So this morning, it was interesting. I had a new box of tissues on my desk. Did you know that the tissues turn brown to let you know that you're running out of tissues? I happen to know this, I worked in retail. It's like registered tape, it turns all red, different colors, right, when you're running out. So I mentioned something, and then a new box of tissues appeared on my desk today because there are awesome people here that take care of me. Sometimes I need tissues on a Sunday morning. But I noticed something about these tissues. The box looked a little different. And on the box, it said, professional tissues. It's a different shaped box. Now, I know what it meant, but I was thinking, what is different about this tissue? How is it a professional tissue? Do we have to pay it? No, so I threw it away. Turns out they're no different than the regular tissues on the inside. There was once a philosopher named Diogenes. I'll try to say it in Greek, but it's kind of hard. Diogenes. Diogenes, we'll say it in American. He was a cynic philosopher who lived around the time of Alexander the Great. In fact, they died in the same year, 323 BC, except Diogenes was a little bit older. Diogenes was also more humble than Alexander the Great. He lived a very humble life. He made himself homeless. It is said of him that he only had one possession, a bowl. And when he saw a young boy lapping up water with his hands, he gave him the bowl. It is said that he criticized those who exalted themselves, those who made much of themselves. You could say he was the original troll. He went around trolling people like Plato with chickens. You can read up about that. It's kind of a funny story. Interesting guy. It is also said that he had an encounter with Alexander the Great himself in the city of Corinth, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, hundreds of years later, written to the churches in those cities. In one encounter, it is said that Alexander, so remember, people thought him to be a god, some people, highly exalted figure, King, warrior king, Macedonian king, comes up to humble Diogenes and he says, what do you want of me? And give him anything. Diogenes, I need you to get out of my sunlight. You're blocking the sun. It is said that Alexander walked away from this encounter very impressed. Who talks to a king like that? And he said, if I were not Alexander, I would be Diogenes. Right. In another encounter, it said that Diogenes is looking at a pile of bones, staring intently at them for a long period of time. And it gets Alexander's attention. So Alexander goes up to him and basically says, like, what are you looking at? And he says, I'm looking at your father's bones. His father is Philip. Philippi, Philippians, King Philip, his dad. I'm looking at your father's bones. Funny thing, I can't seem to distinguish his bones from those of the slaves. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. I think Alexander might have gotten the point. However, Alexander died at only 32 years of age after an agonizing 12 days of fever and pain. Indeed, those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Today we are continuing in the rest of the story. This is where, and it's kind of fun, I'm having a lot of cool conversations with people like, I didn't know that story was there. So we're going to see more of that stuff. There's some interesting stuff in the Bible. So we're taking some time to look at it. Last week, we saw that David has sought refuge with the Philistines. They're technically the enemy, but he goes there so that Saul will stop chasing him. While he's there... He's lying to King Achish. He's deceiving him. If we pick up 1 Samuel 28, starting at verse 1, about that time, the Philistines mustered their armies for another war with Israel. King Achish told David, you and your men will be expected to join me in battle. 
Very well, David agreed. Now you will see for yourself what we can do. Then Achish told David, I will make you my personal bodyguard for life. Meanwhile, cut away to, Samuel had died and all Israel had mourned for him. He was buried at Ramah or Ramah, his hometown, and Saul had banned from the land of Israel all mediums and those who consult the spirits of the dead. The Philistines set up camp at Shunem, and Saul gathered all the army of Israel and camped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the vast Philistine army, he became frantic with fear. He asked the Lord what he should do, but the Lord refused to answer him, either by dreams or by sacred lots or by the prophets. Saul then said to his advisors, find a woman who is a medium, some versions will say witch, so I can go ask her what to do. So his advisors say, there's a medium at Endor, not the one with the Ewoks. Anyway, guys, okay, never mind. I try. <laughs> Come on, Star Wars fans. So Saul immediately breaks his own rule. He's a hypocrite all throughout. So he gets disguised and goes out at night. He brings two men with him. And this is kind of funny. Remember the baggage? He tried to hide behind the baggage, but he's a head taller than everyone else. So there's an element of humor in here. He's really bad at hide and go seek. So again, he disguises himself and he goes to this medium. But the medium knows the rules. So she says, no, you're trying to get me killed here. I'm not going to do it. I promise, I swear, nothing's going to happen to you if you do this. Finally, he convinces her. So, okay, who do you want me to conjure up? Samuel. Now, the text is kind of funny because there's no like, okay, she got the Ouija board out and there's a crystal ball or whatever it is. None of that happens. It just says, boom, when she saw Samuel, she freaked out. You're Saul. You're trying to deceive me. What does he look like? Like a god coming up out of the ground. Kind of interesting. Well, describe him to me. Well, it's a man with robes describes Samuel. So immediately Saul starts conversing with him. He's kind of grouchy. Like, why did you disturb me? What's going on here? He's not happy about it. But Saul's freaking out. The Philistines are after me. What are we going to do? He's like, well, <laughs> this happened to you because you didn't deal with the Amalekites. God has torn the kingdom from you. He says, oh, and by the way, tomorrow you and your sons are going to be here with me. Well, Saul's pretty upset. That's bad news. So he's flattened out on the ground. He doesn't want to eat. He's refusing food. But finally, this medium convinces him to eat. So she feeds him, and he goes on his way. So we see again the flawed character of Saul as his rule declines. Meanwhile, for Samuel 29.1, the entire Philistine army now mobilized at Aphek, and the Israelites camped at the spring in Jezreel. As the Philistine rulers were leading out their troops in groups of hundreds and thousands, really large army, David and his men marched at the rear with King Achish. But the Philistine commanders demanded, what are these Hebrews doing here? And Achish, remember, they're the enemy. And Achish told them, this is David, the servant of King Saul of Israel. He's been with me for years, and I've never found, key word, a single fault in him from the day he arrived until today. But the Philistine commanders were angry. Send him back to the town you've given him. Ziklag, they demanded. He can't go into battle with us. What if he turns against us in battle and becomes our adversary? Is there any better way for him to reconcile himself with his master Saul than by handing our heads over to him? Isn't this the same David about whom the women of Israel sing in their dances? Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. So we don't really know. The text doesn't tell us whether David intends on doing that. However, he's been letting Saul off the hook again and again. So maybe this is true. We've heard this song before. Remember this whole thing has been said of David before, but Achish lets him know, operative word, found, found. David protests, basically, you haven't found a single fault in me, right? But we know he's lying. He's deceiving him. After the protest, he agrees to leave, and it says this, 1 Samuel 29, 11. So David and his men headed back into the land of the Philistines while the Philistine army went on to Jezreel. 
If we turn the page, 1 Samuel 31 says, three days later, when David and his men arrived uh, home at their town of Ziklag, they found that the Amalekites had made a raid into the Negev and Ziklag. They had crushed Ziklag and burned it to the ground. They had carried off the women and children and everyone else, but without killing anyone. When David and his men saw the ruins and realized what happened to their families, they wept until they could weep no more. David's two wives, Ahinoam from Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of that mean man Nabal from Carmel, were among those captured. David was now in great danger because all his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters. And they began to talk about stoning him. But David found strength in the Lord his God. That was key, remember last week. David finds his strength in the Lord. So David, he consults with the priest. God is not listening to Saul anymore. God is listening to David, Abiathar. He has the ephod, that priestly garment. And the Lord says, go, you're going to be successful in this. So they take 600 men. Remember, 600 was an operative number. It keeps coming up again and again and again, 600 men. Remember the men from Benjamin. This is how many they had left. And something interesting happens. They get to the brook of Beor, and they split. 200 are tired, it says in this account, so they stay behind. And 400 go on ahead. So this is kind of a reverse picture of what happened with the brides for Benjamin, if you've been paying attention. Remember, they're at Jabesh, Jabesh Gilead. And then they get the 400 for them there out of the 600, and then they go to Shiloh. And there's that funny kind of scene, well, it's not really funny, where they're kidnapping the women and carrying them off. They get the other 200. So there's like a reverse split. You could say it's foreshadowing going on here. So the 400 go on, and they run into an Egyptian slave. He was a slave of the Amalekites. He'd been left behind because he says he was sick. They left him behind. He's hungry. Hasn't eaten anything for three days. So they give him some bread and water, fig cakes, cluster of raisins. He gets a little bit better, and David approaches him. Tell me where they are. I want to find them. Will you be my guide? Sure. As long as you don't kill me or give me back to my master, that would be good, because it wouldn't be good, because he's a traitor now, right? Shows them where they are. They find the Amalekites. They see them partying in the fields, and the 400 men go and attack them. They get their stuff back. They come back to the brook to the 200 men. David is happy to see them, but the men are not. They say, no, 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 no. Give them back their families, but no plunder for them. They didn't come out and fight with us. They don't get any. David says, no, 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 no. We're all equal in this. Now, something interesting happens. He says, those who stay behind to watch the equipment are just as important as the frontline warriors. If you were paying very close attention, you would have noticed that in chapter 25, when he goes to get that mean guy Nabal, Abigail saves the day, he doesn't do it, but he leaves 200 behind to watch the equipment and takes 400. So this is a practice, and he decrees that this is going to stay a practice. The people who watch the equipment get a fair share as the frontline workers. If we turn the page, 1 Samuel 31.1, now the Philistines attacked Israel, and the men of Israel fled before them. Many were slaughtered on the slopes of Mount Gilboa. The Philistines closed in on Saul and his sons, and they killed three of his sons, Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malkishua. The fighting grew very fierce around Saul, and the Philistine archers caught up with him and wounded him severely. Saul groaned to his armor bearer, take your sword and kill me before these pagan Philistines come run me through and taunt and torture me. But his armor bearer was afraid and wouldn't do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When his armor bearer realized that Saul was dead, he fell on his own sword and died beside the king. So Saul, his three sons, his armor bearer, and his troops all died together on the same day. Horrible scene. The people in the surrounding towns see it. They flee. The Philistines take over everything. They're going and getting the loot off the bodies. They take Saul's armor. They cut off his head, and they fasten him to a wall of the city of Beth Shen. 1 Samuel 31, 11. But when the people of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, all their mighty warriors traveled through the night to Beth Shen and took the bodies of Saul and his sons down from the wall. They brought them to Jabesh, where they burned the bodies. Then they took their bones and buried them beneath the tamarisk tree at Jabesh, and they fasted for seven days. And they gathered up the bones. 
I wonder if they could distinguish Saul's bones from the bones of anyone else. You see, Diogenes, he had a point. We're all equal in death. Both kings and slaves alike must die, ashes to ashes. Saul, he made much of himself. He's very narcissistic, as we saw. Self-centered, but in the end, he was humbled. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus, like Diogenes, is criticizing those who puff themselves up in their leadership, make much of themselves. They're exalting themselves. In this case, the Pharisees. Jesus is going to go on a tear in Matthew chapter 23. He says this, Don't let anyone call you rabbi, for you have only one teacher, and all of you are equal as brothers and sisters. And don't address anyone here on earth as father, for only God in heaven is your father. And don't let anyone call you teacher, for you only have one teacher, the Messiah. The greatest among you must be a servant, but those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, clearly, there's a little bit of hyperbole here, because later, if we keep reading, it's okay to call people teacher. That's just fine. But Jesus is making a point equal. In fact, if you're a leader, less than. Jesus teaches us we must humble ourselves. In Luke 14, he probably has Proverbs 25, 6 through 7 in mind, when Jesus noticed that all who had come to the dinner table were trying to sit at the seats of honor near the head of the table. He gave them this advice. When you're invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. What if someone who is more distinguished than you has also been invited? The host will come and say, give this person your seat. Then you will be embarrassed and you have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. Then when your host sees you, he will come and say, friend, we have a better place for you. Then you will be honored in front of all the other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Getting a theme here. Jesus uses himself as an example of humility. Of course, we know about the cross, ultimate humility. But before that, he's having his last supper with his disciples. This is in the gospel account of John. You don't get this exact detail in the other ones. Why we have four gospels. Well, he's getting ready for the supper. He's sitting at the table, but a couple items he has to address first. Judas. He knows who's going to betray him. But before Judas leaves the table, he does something interesting. Takes off his robe, girds himself, wraps a towel around himself, and then proceeds to wash the disciples' feet. Now we have to assume that G Judas is there. Remarkable. He gets to Peter. Peter protests. Whoa, who are you to wash my feet? Nah, if I don't do this, you're not clean. Okay, wash my head and my hands too. No, just the feet will be fine. Washes their feet, John 13, 12. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you want to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. This is true Christianity. Servant leadership. Loving your enemies. Last week, remember? Bless, don't curse. Love everyone. It's easy to love those who love you back. Even sinners do that. Love your enemies. Serve them. Wash your Judas's feet. Hmm. Some of the writers of the New Testament refer to themselves as slaves. That's the reason for it. They know Jesus' teaching. Yes, I, Paul, 
happen to be an apostle, but I'm a slave of Christ Jesus. That's the intro to his letters, not Apostle Paul. No, Paul, an apostle, a messenger, that's what it means, and a slave of Jesus. Read it. It says servant, cross it out. It's the wrong word in Greek. Slave is the word he's using. It's supposed to have force because of what Jesus does. If Jesus did this, who's Paul? He writes to the church in Ephesus. The emphasis in Ephesus is unity. He's trying to bring the church together. So it's got some big theology in the beginning, and it starts to narrow down into people groups. Jews and Gentiles want you to get along. You're all the body of Christ. Then husbands and wives and kids, like how you should all be treating one another for the sake of the gospel. So we don't slander it. We can do that. He gets down to slaves. Ephesians 6, 5, slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. That's interesting. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ, trying to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Work with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do, whether we are slaves or free. Work as if we're working for Jesus. If you're familiar with the Gospel of Matthew, you know what happens when we get to chapter 25. It's a really hard teaching. The sheep and the goats. It's tough. Right? What you did to the least of these, you did it to Jesus. He tells people where they're going if they do that. Very hard teaching. We must work. We must treat everybody as if they're Jesus. That's what he's teaching. Many Christians forget this. Treat everyone if they're, as if they're Jesus himself. And you know what? There's no task too small. Think about the 200 men David left behind. You're moving an army around. It's a lot of people. We do a lot of stuff here in church in the morning. It's not as many people. A lot of logistics. Watch the equipment, it says. But I bet, just a guess, there's a little bit more to it than that. You think they had to cook? Stuff has to be maintained? Were there animals and horses and stuff like that that need to be fed and cleaned up after? Probably. Did anybody ever get hurt in battle? Probably. So did you need medical people? Like hospital workers and things? Yeah, they're important. And I'll say this much, just kind of reiterating what, reiterating what David said, they get a share. They're, they're equal to the frontline warriors. The warriors in the back are just as important. And so are those who serve this way in the church. Those who serve humbly. As David's warriors who stayed behind with the equipment, they're very important. So are those who serve in the unseen ministries. There are a lot of them. And there's no task too small. It brings me great joy to get here early on a Sunday morning, see what nobody else is probably going to see. Come in the front door, and there's the kids' room there. And they're getting the kids' room ready, but there's more to it than just maybe holding a baby or something like that. No, there's a lot going on. That's very important, because I don't like holding babies. I don't like cleaning boogers and tissues. Even though we have professional tissues, I don't like using them. So, great, you hold the babies. <laughs> they cry. I don't like it. So that's important to me, because I can't do everything. So that makes me smile. Then, I talk to other people who put together the kids' lessons. That wasn't fun this week. Oh, let's see, what are we going to teach the kids about? A witch, people impaling themselves on their own swords? Awesome. So do you want to do the kids' lesson this week? Not it, but they do. And they coordinate with me throughout the week. They know what I'm going to preach on. They're looking at the scriptures. They're reading them carefully, figuring out what they can say and what they can't say. They put together activities, like coloring and all kinds of other things. I might like to do that. Then if I keep walking through the church, I see the people getting the coffee ready. 
And I made jokes about the coffee because like if you've been a Christian for a long time and you decide whether you're gonna join a church based on the coffee, please don't stay here. <laughs> I just, it's gonna be problems in the future. I don't wanna hear it. So I don't know, whatever. So that's my gripe about the coffee. But maybe you're new. Maybe you don't know what Jesus said. Now you're sitting there like, wow, I really don't know if I want to sign up for this whole Christianity thing. <laughs> but maybe you don't know. And there are a lot of people like that. And so we want to meet those people where they are. Also, I don't want you falling asleep during the sermon. The snoring is very distracting. So we give you coffee. And that's an important So I pass by them and they're just humbly serving. No one's telling them what to do. I didn't have to call them and say, make sure the coffee's done. No micromanaging. It's pretty awesome. I pass by the staff. If you've ever worked at a church, you know what kind of job that is. Why did I sign up for this? It's a tough job, but they're serving. They're getting everything ready. Then I pass by the worship team. They're getting ready. They're practicing the songs because they want to honor you and lead you in worship and honor the Lord. There's all kinds of stuff going on. So then I go upstairs. The kitchen, there's people getting stuff in the kitchen ready. The coffee people again, because that's where we make the coffee, and they got to go up and down, up and down, up and down. And I appreciate these people. They're important, just as important as anyone on the front line. We're all equal. Then there's the media. I joke. If it's your first time here and you don't get it, you will. This is like a live studio audience. We film it, we stream it, but that's actually not the big thing. The big thing is getting it out online. That's where it really gets all the views. But still, there's a lot going on here. So I coordinate with the person that does the slides. They get my message, usually on Friday or Saturday. And they put together the whole thing, well, everything you see here. It's all put together. And so we check and we go through all the scriptures, make sure we get them right so there's no distractions. So that's a whole thing. The person working the camera, the sound, they need to be able to hear me. All important. The videos that you see, all custom made. Something about C3, we don't buy programs. This is not a program, church. Everything you're hearing today, if it's not scriptural, it's original. And so are the videos. They make them. It's pretty cool, right? It's a neat intro video. I like it. That's all custom made. It's all done. All original. It's amazing what goes on here. Then it goes out to social media. Lately, the sermons have been getting a couple thousand views. It's a lot more than we can fit in here, isn't it? And then it goes on different social media platforms that you wouldn't think of. We know that all the kids are, there's an exodus from Facebook. So we had to chase them, right? Like the Amalekites and find out where they are. <laughs> like, where did these kids go? Because our Facebook views went from like 200 to zero. Like, where, so what happened here? And it's only the old people complaining about everything. So where do we go? Crazy places like TikTok. I thought it was just kids dancing and stuff like that, but it's not. So we got a TikTok account, and we're getting like thousands of views. Think about it. There's kids who can be looking at all kinds of other stuff that are actually hearing the gospel. Amen? It's amazing. So we go to these weird places, Instagram or whatever, and we get lots of views. So it's important. It's really important. So all of this is important. Every single job. And I didn't even get to the administration. <laughs> if you've been an administrator of anything, you know that's a crazy job. But for a church, it's worse. <laughs> really crazy. There's the people that do all that stuff in the business meetings and the building. And we have tenants and they deal with all kinds of crazy things that some pastors try to take on and then they just burn out. They deal with that for me. So I don't have to take those phone calls. I don't have to sit here and it's like, oh, Gene, there's another coffee salesman here. Great. That's important. You know, so they take care of all this crazy stuff, and it's more than just that. Then there are those who participate by giving, because none of this is free, unfortunately. None of it. And so you're our support. We need you to get all of this done. It doesn't happen without your giving. Nothing. So I want to give you some encouragement this week. A couple weeks ago, I said, if you haven't already done so, and you want to, get off the bench. Come and see me. How? Well, kind of old-fashioned idea here, throwing out there, like come up to me, <laughs> shake my hand. It's okay, we can do that, right? Give me a hug. And say, what can I do? Very simple. If you're shy, fill out a connection card. Carol Lee will tell you how to do that. There's like tables out there, and you just give us your name, email. I want to help. I want to be a part of what you're doing here. I want to participate. You'll be told about the app. I know a lot of people don't like the apps and the phones, but it's very efficient. We are supporting two churches in India 
for what the bulletins and all that other stuff costs. That was the exchange. So what do you think we should do? The paper stuff and all the goodie bags or support the pastors in India? Don't give me the wrong answer. <laughs> all of these people are so important. I want to just encourage you today. I want to thank you. This is a very operative church. The statistics is like, oh, 20% of the people are serving and then 80% of the people consume. Here, it's the opposite. It's really weird. Like 80% of the people who come here are serving. Like, so we're just all serving each other. That's what we do here. But it's beautiful. It's a really beautiful thing. And the consumers, they don't like this church because of what I just said. I'm not going to give you the refrigerator magnet and the coffee koozie thing. No, we're going to do good with that. And so they leave. No, I've actually had people say things like that. Like, oh, it's a little early. I'm hungover. And so it's too early to come to church. You know what I mean? You don't know oh, the coffee. We had someone bring us creamer because our creamer wasn't good enough. It's like, go, go. I'm done. Just done with churchianity. But you people are awesome. You're the body of Christ because that is what church is. It's not a building. It's not consumerism. It's not a thing. It's a body, the body of Christ. And this church is really operative, which is beautiful. And I want to take a minute just to encourage you because normally I'm like, <sighs> I do the opposite. You guys are awesome. Beautiful things are happening here. But perhaps, out of all these unseen warriors, the most powerful warriors are the prayer warriors. The most powerful warriors. Unseen warriors are the prayer warriors. I told you last week that I was ministering to a woman who has late stage cancer. I told you like how we should be dealing with this stuff, not like how Christians deal with it on social media or politics and things. No, 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 no. This is how we're peacemakers. So what was the process? Okay, I know you're afraid. That's normal. We're told in the Bible that can be intelligent, right? Talked about that last week. I get it. So let's not lie. Start this whole session by lying. Let's just be honest. We're scared. David was scared. Jesus was scared. Yep, that's true. But let's move that fear to faith. Through prayer, we're going to pray for the immediate. We pray, we believe in miracles. I've seen them. I'll tell you about one in a minute. I believe that they happen. I believe that. But I believe it's by the Lord's will, not ours. He's not a genie in the bottle. No, we cannot manipulate God. So if it's his will, Lord, please heal this immediate problem. Okay, we're just we're begging you to heal it. And then give me a testimony. That's what it's for, really. Give me a testimony. So we pray for calm. I met with this woman last week. Again, we're praying over the situation. And if the cancer, if the cancer wasn't bad enough, there's a whole pile of other problems. One of them being her grandkids were kidnapped, were missing. Can you imagine that? For two years, she has not seen her grandchildren. They're missing. Okay. So we pray over that whole situation. We're just praying and praying and praying. We had another meeting immediately after in the offices. And so we say our goodbyes. I go into the office for staff meeting. Not too long, knock at the door, like maybe a few minutes. I open the door, and it's this woman. She has a cell phone in her hand. Like I think she's on the phone and just has this like expression on her face, like she just had her mind blown, she's crying. And here's the thing about working in ministry. You get kind of pessimistic. Because it's been said that no one ever comes in here with a winning lottery ticket. If you're that person today, please tithe it. We, we can get a, just throwing that out there. We get a lot done. Just saying, okay? So I'd be remiss and the board would be mad at me if I didn't say that. So... But that's not the case, right? Hey, pastor, I won lotto. No. A lot of people, you're here, why? Well, a lot of you are broken. I get it. I meet with you. I know the stories. That's why you're here. Why? And spread this, please. This is where you come for peace, right? 
That's why we don't do the politics, because we come here for peace, not politics. And so I'm trying to be a peacemaker. I'm trying to agitate you. That's why I do that, because I communicate with so many broken people, and I know that. So here's the thing. It's all of the time. That's why we need vacations and days off, because it's just hard. And so confession, here's what I do. All in a split second, I take a look at her, and I go, what now? Really? That's what I'm saying in my head. Not aloud. I'm doing what pastors do. You know, but inside, come on. Really? This woman needs, what happened? In my head, I'm making all these assumptions, right? She backed into somebody. Someone hit her car. You know, dead cat. I don't know, whatever. I'm going through these things and I'm mad. What now, Lord? You know what the woman says? They found the kids. Yeah, you can say hallelujah to that. The Lord will fight our battles. The prayer warriors are the ones who are faithful in believing that the Lord will fight our battles. And indeed, the Lord will fight our battles if we submit to him. We believe that he's going to take care of it. We have faith. I know we get afraid. and We have to submit and give that fear to God. It's yours, Lord. I trust you. I believe this. That's the key. I trust you. No matter what, whether the immediate need, I don't know. I just trust you with everything implicitly. That's the kind of faith we need to get through this. I just trust you. If we exalt him and not ourselves, if we worship him and not our minds, ourselves, our ideas, our opinions, we just give all that to him. If we come to him and all reverence and humility, really humble. I don't know. I don't know, Lord, but you do, and I trust you. No matter what, I love you, and I trust you. Same way I did as a child. Real faith. I had a friend once say, you know, you know the kind of faith I want to have, Gene? Remember when you were a kid, and you just, you just hopped in the truck with Dad, or the car with Mom, and you didn't even know where you were going. You were just happy to be with him. That. I don't know where we're going. I have no idea. But Father, I'm just happy to be with you. That's enough for me. And you know what? If I die, better for me to be with the Lord than to be here. That faith. That faith. We need to put our faith in the word, not the world. So I want to encourage you with that. We need to believe that he will fight our battles. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for this church, and that is the body of Christ, every single soul. I pray for those who are going to watch this later. Lord, touch their hearts. May we be peacemakers as we go out this week being vessels of your love, your mercy, your grace, bringing people love, joy, with patience, peace, kindness, self-control. That's all from you. By the power of your Holy Spirit, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you.